Hello, good afternoon everybody. My name is Jeffrey Chang. Um, I'm originally from the US, uh, but I've been working in Korea for over five years now at Fluxus Inc. handling global business. Just to give a quick introduction about Fluxus Inc. Uh, it started out as a music label back in 2002 and over the years of operation in 2017, we started a uh, global distribution music business. So our specialty for distribution is to bring um, Korean contents overseas, and then of course helping uh, overseas content come into Korea. And we help bridge the obstacles that exist uh, when going from one to the other. And so that's what I'm gonna be specifically talking about today, which is uh, the metadata and standardization of the metadata when going from, uh, from domestic to global. Uh, so just to begin, we're going to be uh, going, what we'll be going over today is making an album for the world, what that is, and then we'll be doing a comparison of Korea and the world. After, we will be talking about uh, specific uh, differences in the global metadata, and finally, why it all matters. Okay, so the, to begin, um, creatively, making an album from the world, at the creative level, there's really no difference. It's essentially uh, the same. So if we look at what a song is, we can break it down into two different rights. One is the copyright, which is typically for the uh, composition and the music. Then there's the master right, which is the rights related to the specific sound recording. Here, I included just sort of a last bit, which deals with the monetization of those rights. And specifically, I'm gonna be looking at the licensing to music services aspect of that. So if we look at the life of a song, we can see that at the beginning, it's always you know, creating, creation of the music. And so once that, uh, the, the song is made, that's where the copyright uh, will arise. Then you would take that composition, you would bring it into the studio with your artist, and you would make a sound recording. This is where the master right arrives. And a lot of times, many people think that's sort of the end of uh, the song making process, but there actually is a very important third step, which is the care of your metadata. Metadata is what also needs to be delivered to the music services when you license out your content. And it is what is used to identify that that song is your song. And so you can treat that as almost like a national, your national security number, but for music. And it is what music services use to make payments to you. So it's very important that you take care of that metadata. So moving forward, you know, that was just a brief summary. Moving forward, we are gonna be looking at um, some comparisons of the Korean digital market and the world. So to begin, we can actually take a look at what the music services look like. And on the left, we see Korea, which is a very interesting uh, market on its own because of how robust and strong it is. So Korea's digital market actually is um, essentially exist, it can exist on its own and has been, has, has been, uh, sorry. So in, in Korea, the, uh, the music services has, is very robust and has been operating since the beginning of the digital market. And you can see that it's dominated by domestic music services. If we compare that to the world, we can see of course that the global music services are dominant. But the key thing that I wanna point out here is merely the size difference. So, if we look at Apple Music on its own, Apple Music to this day has reported approximately 68 million paid users. So that is greater than the entire population of Korea. If we include Spotify, which is twice, which reports twice as many users, we can just see that the, the size of each, uh, uh, between the world and the Korea is very, very large. So there's a lot of opportunity when going into the world. So there are, of course, there are obstacles when trying to go from uh, one area to the other. And so I wanna highlight uh, four key differences that um, I, I constantly see as an issue. First, we have lead time. Then we have delivery methods. Then we have time releases. And of course, the metadata. So what is lead time? So lead time is the time from when the content provider provides the music to the service and when the service opens the album. And so in Korea, typically we have a one to two day, one to two day lead time, which is actually quite quick. 
Um, but in Korea, it can work just because the size and the scale of the Korean market um, allows uh, for a more nimble approach to delivering your content. If we compare that to the world, the world standard actually requests a two week lead time. And that's simply because the amount of content that global services have to deal with uh, every day, you're gonna need more time to allow for the release to open. If you're trying to include some marketing and pitching uh, at the global level, you might need to include, uh, increase that to three weeks. So if you are bringing the Korean style release of lead time to the world, and you use that standard, you run the risk of not having your album open on time. And that, of course, will cause a lot of problems for your business. Okay. Um, and so next, we want to talk about the delivery methods between Korea and the world. So in Korea, um, given that it's very fast, it's, it uses a very convenient method of just email, attaching files, you usually work with somebody at the music services. So the Korean style of delivering your content is actually quite convenient. However, the one negative side to that is you can't really scale that to a larger amount of content. If we compare that to the world, the world has adopted a standard called DDEX. Now DDEX is a, you know, a technical standard, which means that it's not going to be as convenient as say an email or attachment, but the large benefit for using DDEX is that you can scale up to large amounts of content. So what is DDEX? So just a little uh, quick history about DDEX. So DDEX was founded in 2006. It was uh, created as a standards setting organization. So the whole purpose of this is to create standards to be used around the world. So DDEX was founded by a group of different media companies, license, music licensing companies, um, rights owners, and tech companies. That include some example charter members as Amazon, Google, Apple, Spotify, Sony Universal, ASCAP, and PRS. So the main purpose of why they wanted to create the standard is to create an effective way of communicating information between companies. So the whole purpose of this is to increase efficiency as it moves along the supply chain, and that results in a reduction of costs, and it can increase your revenues. So just a, a simple example of some standards that are included in DDEX is you know, the different kinds of formats. When delivering your metadata, it should be in XML format, and the XML will have its own uh, you know, format for the data that's included there. Sound source should be in WAVE, album art will be in uh, PNG file. So everything is treated the same and every service that uses DDEX will expect this kind of information to be coming in. So if we look at the diagram below, we can see how it makes it very effective. When the content provider, they can use DDEX to uh, send their assets and information to the distributor. The di distributor can use DDEX to provide that to the platform and the platform can provide royalty information back to the rights holder all using the DDEX format. So there's no confusion along the chain about how you're gonna receive or what the information is going to look like because everything is standardized. So if we remove, if we go back to the different delivery methods, we can see that in Korea, Korea using the email and attachment uh, method is going to require you to prepare a package delivery for each service. So in this case, if you want to make a release, you're gonna to have to prepare metadata the way Melon likes it and then deliver that to Melon and then Bugs and the same with Vibe, Flow, and Genie or any other music service that you are delivering to in Korea. But if we look at the world, the world having over a hundred, you know, hundreds of different music services, DDEX standard really helps in that it allows you to do uh, your delivery in one shot. And so if you prepare your package and your delivery uh, in the DDEX format, you would be about 95% ready to deliver to any music partner uh, that accepts DDEX. There will be some you know, minor requirements change service to service, but it allows you to scale up to a lot of different services, allowing you to reach the maximum amount of people for your content. Sorry, oh my God. It doesn't want to do it. Okay, 
Sorry about that. Okay, so the next one is going to be, uh, we're gonna be looking at release times, and it's really more about release styles. So in Korea, Korea has always focused on the Korean market before. You know, given that Korea has such a strong and robust digital market, there was never really a need to because there's a lot of opportunities that exist in the market already. So when making a release, the importance uh, and focus has always been about impacting the charts and to maximize your front page exposure. So by setting a specific time, such as 6 p.m. in Seoul, you're not really thinking about what that means around the world because you never had to. 6 p.m. in Seoul is approximately 4 a.m. in the morning in New York. If we compare this to the world, the world follows a follow the sun strategy, which is they only focus on the date, and when the day turns in each time zone, that's when your content will typically open. And this represents sort of a different style of, um, of approach to releasing your content. In Korea, the importance of charting, uh, the, the importance of charting is the main way that people listen to their music. So the real-time charts are updated about every hour. However, if you compare that to the world, the world doesn't really have charts that update that frequently. So the importance of putting into the chart is not as great as, say, organic discovery and growth and strategic placement of your content in the playlists around the world. So if you're coming from Korea, and you're trying to go to the world, you might need to rethink your strategy and how you can get your fans to access in your music, or it's just gonna be lost in the massive amounts of content that comes into the global music services every day. The last, the last bit, uh, okay, the last uh, thing I wanna talk about is just regarding basic metadata. So if we look here, this is the very uh, common information that is supplied uh, all over the world. Every song is going to have an artist, there's gonna be some album name to it, the tracks that are involved, composers, maybe company, and some kind of code. So typically you would think that there's not gonna be any issue here because it's just so basic, but when you compare Korea and the world, there's still gonna be issues that arise even at this basic metadata level, um, stemming from language or uh, translation or lack thereof, or uh, spelling and you know, how you process that information. So if you're trying to bring your Korean standard metadata and you think that just having this information to global music services, you're gonna have uh, a bad time trying to get your uh, content to be effective. Okay, so now I wanna jump into discussing about global metadata and the differences that exist uh, between the two. So to begin, this is the, I wanna talk about the different kinds of identification codes for the product and the, uh, the track level information. So in Korea, they use what's known as a UCI code. That stands for Universal Content Identifier. This content is managed by the Korean Copyright Commission and it functions, as to assign, uh, it functions by assigning one UCI code to one content. If you look at the example below, the information held within is, of course, there's a connection to the agency, there's a code for the product, and then there's a code related to the track. If we compare that to the global standard, um, global standard uses a combination of UPC, which is a universal product code, and it's most commonly uh, recognized as a barcode, as you see on the side. And then that is used in combination with an ISRC code, which is International Standard Recording Code. This is managed by the IFPI. So the combination of UPC and ISRC functions in the same way as, okay, I can change, it, fun oh my God. it functions in the same way as the UCI code. They both cover uh, the album information and they both cover the track information. However, the global standard for the global music services adopted the UPC code. So if you try to take UPC and ISRC, so if you try to take the UCI code into the global music services, it's not, they're not gonna know how to identify your track as your song. So next is an issue of localization. So here we see the, uh, a picture of an idol group from the late 90s, early 2000s called Dongbang Singi. So if you have metadata in Korea, if you look at the first name in Hangul, that's good enough for the Korean market. You know, everyone in Korea can read Korean, so it's not a problem. However, if you want to bring this to the global market, not everybody in the world understands or can read Korean. 
So if you see below, you have other names. We have Tongbang Singgi in English phonetic of the Korean. Beneath that, we have the Chinese phonetic of the, the name. Below that, we have a common abbreviation used by K-pop fans around the world for the, for the same band. And then lastly, we have the official English name that's used uh, by, the, by the band called TVXQ, which interestingly is the abbreviation using the Chinese phonetic name. So it can get a little confusing. And so the important thing to note here is that when, when bringing your metadata to the world, the standard should be you want to try to include as much information and identification information to your group. If you were to only supply Tongbang Shingi to a global music service, there's a strong likelihood that the fans are not going to be able to find your content in the service. So the next bit of uh, metadata that's different deals with the rules around what explicit content is. So in Korea, of course, the standard is going to be following issues around Korean language and bad words and explicit content and situations. There's also a review by a government body that will look at your content to sort of make sure everything is, uh, is, is correct. But if we try to bring that to the world, the world uses an English standard. So you know, bad words and explicit content that are recognized in English will be what, what causes an explicit status. And it doesn't factor in any of the Korean swear words or explicit content, and there's no review. So if you are bringing uh, your Korean, uh, Korean rules to the global services um, with you didn't mark your content properly and they find out that is it, it is explicit, your content can get taken down. If your content's taken down, you're not going to be gaining any listens. So, of course, this is going to be a problem. So you're going to need to change the standard when following the explicit rules. So to conclude this section, I want to go over a few examples of real issues that we have faced when delivering content to Apple. So the reason why I'm using Apple uh, examples is because we hold Apple to have one of the highest standards uh, around their metadata uh, among uh, of the global music services. So in this example, we can see some issues with the artist name. So in Korea, you know, we can provide the artist name with some kind of information to the side, and that would be completely okay on domestic uh, music services. However, if you want to bring that to metadata to Apple Music, they have a lot more different standards and rules that need to be followed. So below, we can, I'm actually just citing the specific rules and some notes from Apple that we received when we delivered this content. Basically, it's saying that we cannot include the, the information in the parentheses and it should be removed. So instead of, uh, you know, Ari of some idol group, we should just name the artist Ari. So this next example deals with information on the track level, which is a lot of the times uh, uh, Korean songs like to include a producer name in the track title. So similar to the first one, this is not something that's standard and it's going to need to be adjusted in the metadata before it can go live on the service. So in Korea, you would be able to say the track name Monday produced by Tuesday, but on Apple, it can only be Monday. So it's a little bit strict and uh, it can cause some problems because you, know, you want to show the credit for the producer, but that's the global standard, and if you want to reach the, the global population of listeners there, you're going to need to follow these rules. So this next example is another example of along the song titles. It calls for consistency. So if we see in the first one, on Apple, we could have delivered a song, It's Not What It Seems. However, if we look on Melon, if the song name is different, It's Not What It Seems To Be, that would be an issue for Apple because Apple requires to have consistent song naming even across other platforms. This holds true for an album or a pre-single. So if you were, for example, were to be releasing the pre-single before the album with one name, but then on the album, when the album's released, decided to change one of the song names to be a little different, there would be a problem on the album. Because the pre-single came first and that was the metadata that was set, they need it to be consistent when the same track is used, even in a different album. 
And so the last uh, example I want to show to you is even beyond data, the, the album art is also uh, under standard as well. So at least for Apple, they require that no words such as exclusive or limited edition to be had on the album art. The same thing for the art, similar to uh, song titles and artist name, the album art must also be consistent over the different platforms. So we have one album art that's used on Melon, that should be the same exact album art that's used on Apple Music Services. You cannot change the album art, even if that is uh, part of your plan, it won't, uh, it won't work for Apple standard. Okay, so we've talked a lot about uh, you know, the differences and compared the two territories and different uh, metadata, but why does it all matter? So the, the two main points that I can use to sum up these two uh, situations is one, it maximizes the royalty potential of your content, and two, standardizing the metadata allows you to access new revenues. So regarding the maximization of royalties, I want to take a look at, this is a standard example of the value chain from the rights owner sending to music service, earning royalties, and coming back. So this is, the, uh, this is the same in Korea as it is would be in the world. We have the rights owner. They deliver metadata that's to standard to the distributor. A distributor will then be able to provide that content to the music service. Music service will then open everything to the listener. Listener listens, data comes back, the reporting comes back, and payment comes back. So everything is uh, you know, very, very straightforward as long, from, as long as the metadata is correct. But let's take a look at what happens to your royalty potential if you have uh, non-standard metadata. So from the very beginning, if you are delivering metadata that is non-standard or has issues going to the targeted global music service, when you deliver that to the distributor, the distributor typically is not able to change the metadata for you. They do not have the right. It is your data, so it is your right to take care of it. So when this happens and you deliver your content and your metadata, you start out with 100% royalty potential. Whatever you deliver and whatever it can earn is the maximum amount that you will earn. However, if we continue down the value chain, we can see that the non-standard met metadata can cause issues when the distributor tries to send that content to the music service. Maybe not every song is acceptable to the music service, or the music service has missing information. And so what used to be a 10 song album can somehow become maybe an eight song album because two of the songs are not properly arriving to the music service. So now your royalty potential has been reduced amount. If we continue going further, Sorry, okay. If we continue down the next step, once the music service has released the content, of the content that they were able to, uh, to receive and make live to the user, perhaps the metadata wasn't properly localized or perhaps the explicit settings are not, uh, are not properly set. And so what ends up happening is the music service will end up having to take down the content or they have to hide it. So of the eight songs that made it from the original 10, Maybe only six songs are now available to the users with two of them grayed out because they are explicit. And so again, the total amount of royalties that you could have earned is once again reduced because the listeners are not able to listen to every song that you're putting out. If we keep going again, the next step will also result in some kind of reduction in royalty potential. You know, users, when they're listening to songs, they've made playlists. And so if you are delivering content that is being identified to you. However, there's another bit of content that is the exact same song before it, but the metadata is not clear enough to differentiate the two, then there's a chance that the user might be listening to the wrong delivery. If the user is listening to the delivery from a previous distributor or a previous kind of uh, delivery, then the money that is earned and the listens that are earned on that data will be sent to that other partner or a past business partner. And other ones that do happen to listen to you will be sent to you. So you're not actually getting the full amount of listens to your content if there are two competing songs of the same track. 
And then so here, when the music service has compiled all that listening data, there's actually not uh, any revenue royalty loss here, but what it does show is an inaccurate representation of your catalog being sent back to you. What you think is um, full listening of your albums uh, when in actuality it might not be. You might think that that one song that your title track is not performing uh, really well in certain markets or you can draw the wrong conclusions just simply because the reporting is actually inaccurate because the metadata that is used to generate those reports is not accurate. And so finally, in the last step when you get back to it, the, the payment that's coming in, you, know, you can't be sure about what uh, what has been listened to and what has not because the metadata has been not correct this whole time. So what you think coming in is just a poor performance and not earning really well actually might be a reduction of royalties because, you, because of poor metadata management and non-standard information that has reduced the profit potential of your content. Okay. The, second, uh, the second thing I want to talk about is accessing new revenues and why standardization is really important. So even though you haven't actually released your content to the world, your content might actually already be already be, be used around the world and collection agencies are collecting those royalties. The problem is collection agencies cannot pay to anyone because they don't have the right information to know that this royalty belongs to you. So I want to use uh, a case study example of a company, an organization in the US called Sound Exchange. So Sound Exchange is a US only organization that collects um, the royalty of digital performances of sound recordings. So this is basically royalties for featured artists and, non, and, and musicians, set musicians, and then it also gets the payment for master right owners for non-interactive use of sound recordings. And so that's something like satellite radio or, uh, or, or music services where you cannot control uh, going forward or going back or skipping. So how does SoundExchange track the information that's being used? Well, of course, they use the standardized metadata and IRCC information. So here is an example of the value chain. Um, if everything is standardized and everything and the, the metadata is uh, a quality, so you have like a Korean rights owner, they deliver quality standardized metadata to an IRCC database, and then the digital broadcasters in the US are providing their information to SoundExchange. So what Sound, Sound Exchange does is they compare the two databases. They look at the usage, and then they look in the database to find who the owner of this is. They collect the money, and then they pay it to the right owner. So if we look, if we look, here, this is actually the amount of money that was paid out in 2019, 2019 only actually. So there's a lot of uh, potential earning that can be had here just in the US alone. So if we jump forward and say what happens when there's no, S no, no ISRC usage, then this whole revenue chain is not available to you. But if we look at the uh, example where you did provide your data, however, that data is not standardized and not up to the quality required, what ends up happening is when the ISRC database is checked by sound exchange against the usage data, they are not able to properly identify your content and your royalties. So instead of distributing the royalties to, back to you, they hold on to those royalties. Now sound exchange, they hold these royalties for three years and then they either repurpose the money for another cause or they distribute it to other people. So they're essentially taking money that should have been yours and giving it away to other people. So if we look here, if we look here, uh, this is the amount of money that's held in Sound Exchange from 2017 to 2019. So every year this money it's dropping away, and any money that revenue, any revenues that you could potentially have are found within this, this amount. Now, again, my example is only dealing with the US. 
Now, there's many, many other countries out in the world that are possibly collecting and holding your royalties that are collecting information based on standardized metadata. If you have standardized metadata, you will be able to explore those avenues such as Sound Exchange or some collection organization in the UK, Australia, and there could be money there waiting for you. So just to wrap up everything and uh, create, uh, you know, summarize everything, I just want to say that you know, there are a lot of opportunities that are found in the world, especially, you know, when, from going from Korea to the world or, you know, coming into Korea itself. But it all comes down to understanding the differences of the markets to maximize the efficiency of your content and embracing the new standards to be most effective uh, in those new territories. So when going from Korea to the world, you know, you would need to understand and manage your metadata and see that it has a lot of value in that it can help you to grow your business and improve your business and, uh, you know, find new lines of revenue to improve, uh, to improve, your, to improve your businesses. Uh, so with that, I just want to say thank you very much for listening. And if you have any, any question, oh my goodness. Okay, sorry about that. Uh, so thank you. If you have any questions, please, please feel free to contact me. Uh, you can just email me and I'll get back to you and help however I can. Thank you very much.